Ken is a villain. Ken is a villain. I, I have to say that with, with certainty. I mean, he's, he's kind of outspoken. He was rude and he was selfish. A little bit, but he's, I think he's a nice guy at heart too. He was a dick. He just had such a dominance over the game compared to everyone else. Somebody who just knows the game so well that they just do exactly everything that they want. No one has ever dominated the game that much for that long. It's almost unseen in any competitive thing I've ever seen in my life. Early on, uh, Salt of Sam 2 was the best Falco on the West Coast, and he'd go online and talk mad trash. Mad, mad trash. He was a guy that like was a little bit arrogant online and, uh, you know, would kind of mouth off to people. Is that the best you can do? It's like, oh, I'm the best. You use Marth. Marth sucks. He's not even top tier. I actually went through pages and pages of Smashboards to the point where I'm like, dude, let's money match. Once I get to TG4, let's money match 50 bucks. Everybody cleared the stages, and Matt Deasy had a like, big screen TV, and, and I, uh, I played Salt in the Samitude. I actually found out before that that um, you can toss Falco and Fox up in the air, and then re grab them and toss them like a hacky sack and just keep on doing it over and over. I beat Sam, and he, he shut up. After TG4, Matt DZ released a DVD about it, and most of the East Coast players actually bought a copy or two, and they were just, they were laughing at us. They're like, oh, look at him. He's an idiot. All he does is move back and forth, like he was dashing back and forth. You know, why would he dash back and forth when he can wave dash? You know, I was still new in the community. I didn't wave dash at the time. All I knew how to do was dash back and forth, and that eventually became uh, dash dancing. Just dashing around, waiting for the person to make a mistake and grabbing them was a very effective strategy combined with his ability to aggressively attack well when openings presented themselves. That's like the weird part about Ken that like he's just such an aggro Marth. When you usually play Marths they're, they're more of a, a spacing character like they try to bait you in and they dash away and grab you like they're always trying to play the space game with you but like with him he would just be all over you. I've seen Ken, I've seen his mind games. His mind games are like sickening. He knows what you're gonna do already. He knows when you're gonna come in. He just really puts so much pressure on you, just like running up to you, making you roll, grabbing you, like just baiting you to do things. He'd get you scared because like a Marth is like intimidating being right next to you. <laughs> I saw the Ken combo and I was like, <laughs> When you did a forward air with Marth, they'd fly up. And then you can do a down air after that and they'd fly down. People started catching on to that and calling it out every single time I'd do that. There's a reason why he was like the most dominant smasher. Huggies, Huggles, just crap like that. So then I just took on the name Hugs. I mean, there's no, 
there's no reason, deeper reason other than that. We actually thought we were already the best in the world, like a lot of people do. We saw the videos, we thought they were fine, but we still thought they could beat, we could beat them. So we show up to our first tournament, which was a bi-weekly at Ken's house. I knew about him, I thought I would beat him the first tournament I went to. It didn't work out the way. In fact, I lost to his younger sister. 14 years old, and I remember Ken and his brother sitting at the couch watching me lose to his little sister. So it was, it was a reality check, it was embarrassing, but I didn't. It, it made me want to play more. They saw the bi weeklies as an, an opportunity to bond and figure out who would be a part of their crew or their alliance. He wanted someone that could support him because he wasn't the most popular person in the Smash community at the time, despite his achievements. It's the underdog mentality go for the player who's not the best, cheer them on, make an upset happen. I think for the whole year I was doing the bio weeklies with them, by the end of it they did consider me part of their family. He would always call me up in 3M saying like, hey Kao, you wanna play Smash? I met some of the people who ran MLG. They're like, oh yeah, we wanna make this big. And I was all for it. off for competitiveness. With his West Coast Alliance, Ken dominated every MLG he went to. The question no one seemed to be able to answer was, who could possibly stop Ken? I would force myself to L-cancel 50 times in a row without missing it. And then it would be, you know, Dash Dancer or whatever it was. And it was a lot of just training and training and getting better. And I had a notebook where I made notes and I would watch videos. It was, it was very serious for me and it was very conscious, specific, directed effort at becoming better. The newlyweds, husband and wife, formed the core of Team Ben, a crew of ambitious Maryland and Virginia players looking to make a name for themselves. In 2005, they took a step in the right direction by teaming up with videographer Eric Reichenbach, or as he came to be known, Bach. Kevin, how was your night last night? Hey, but I'm filming my night last night. Oh! Bach's well-produced montages and documentary videos became the gold standard for Smashers, showing the world what these tournaments were all about, and putting Team Ben front and center. You hear me, Florida? You are going down. I'm going to stand in the end of Georgia and lift you up and throw you into the ocean. That's what I'm going to do. You are going to be gone. 8.8, 8.8. See that? I'm nuts. <laughs> there was 501. There it is. Hey, easy on the camera, dude. You didn't even have so five plates yeah. out. I got two plates. How ritzy is that? I am the Marth Slayer. I don't lose to Marth. Okay, let's just be clear about that. I don't lose to Marth. Um, Kevin, husband, and I have been playing video games together since we were seven, and, and, our, and our synergy is very important. He's my number one practice partner. Um, Kevin is also a douchebag, which is important to the story because when you're playing Kevin, he won't let you stop playing until he wins. I mean, he, he will not, okay? We can be about to go to a party or a movie or to sleep, it doesn't matter. We don't stop playing until Kevin realizes why he's losing. And so if Kevin and I are playing, Marth Peach, Marth Peach, Marth Peach, March Peach, I wanna play Sheik for a while, nope. Let's go catch that movie, we're gonna miss it. Nope, sit down and keep playing t till I win, okay? Because he wants to get better, he's got that drive in him. And he's a jerk, it's a combination of the both. It's a fantastic combination, it's very stubborn though. And so Kevin and I played endless amounts of Marth Peach, so I know everything that Marth can do. Nothing surprises me. It was my destiny to play Kem. It was my destiny because we were rivals as people and because I was the Marth Slayer. And it finally happened that at MLG Atlanta, I was pitted against him. So I walked over to his TV and I said, Kem, we gotta play. And he was like, rrr, rrr. and I was like, no, we don't understand. This is destiny. We play right now. So I sit him down. Marth Peach. He trashes me, trashes me, trashes me. Then I do some ridiculous combos, and I win the first match. I'm done. He makes the error of staying Marth. Same thing. He had the he had the he had a two stack lead on me, but when I'm playing Marth, I don't get nervous. I'm about to beat him and 3-0 um, at an MLG. Big deal. Third match is just to go to Fox. <sighs> as if I don't eat Fox as well. So I'm eating, I'm eating, I'm eating him. It's going great. 
Um, I'm up two stack to one, and he's ready to go. One good ledge guard will do it, no problem. He kills me, and then it's one stack to one stack, and then he pulls the, uh, what I now call the Pokemon Stadium combo, where he's kind of moving me upwards, up air, maybe there's a second up air, I don't know, but a third one would have killed me, but you, Fox can't reach Peach at that level, so I didn't even bother to DI or to air dodge or anything, because Fox can't reach there. But Ken, that resourceful son of a bitch, jumped on the windmill and then got me on the top level. And I died, and I was furious, and that was it, that was my glory. And then I do start to get nervous, which is terrible. I don't know why I went back to Marth. I guess because they did pretty well against this fox, but I, he beat me. I don't really know how. I guess it was the nerves, but I consider it a fluke because I don't lose to Marth. And the final match was on uh, Mute City. <clears throat> it was on Mute City, and uh, I was doing well, as a peach should on, uh, on Mute City, and I was up again two stock to one. You're up. One more. Get some percent. Tiny. All I had to do was just finish him off. I was so nervous. I've never been so nervous in my life. My hands were physically shaking. They were covered with sweat and they were shaking and, and, and I couldn't play and, I, and I'm sorry to John. I, I know that I am. I was clumsy and I must have been obvious and he beat me. God damn, I fucking suck. Good games. And I, I threw my controller and I screamed and I dropped a couple of F-bombs and the hugs taunted me about that for a long time. It was my match to lose and I did and it was very tough. I can't go back and watch the matches on YouTube. It was just too painful. But I do think things would have been different for me if I beat him. I think everything would have been different. Ozan, you did fantastic this tournament. I know it was a real heartbreaker to lose to Ken in the second set on the fifth match, but you won $1,000 for second place. I'd really like to hear about your match with Ken uh, in the finals, in the winner's finals, uh, one versus one. Uh, it was like I was facing Neo. Cause he, he had all the mind games. He was he, he like he knew everything I was gonna do. If you look at tournament records alone, obviously Ken almost always got the better of him. But some of the matches were very close, and there might have been somewhat of a psychological edge Ken had at some point that Azen was just like, oh my god, like I always come so close, but I can't beat him. I'm here at MLG Atlanta with Ken and Isaiah, the winners of the doubles for the Eastern Regional Conference. Husband and wife both gave you guys runs for your money. I don't think the newlyweds were playing, well, I don't think they're that great. Honestly, they're all talk most, mostly. Ken and Isaiah, they said that they were not impressed with you guys and they said they're going to annihilate you next time instead of just a close victory. When the set was over, Ken said to me, you had no chance. Ooh, ooh. But that's the kind of thing that makes a person want to get better. That's exciting. It gives life a little flavor. You know Fight Club when they're asked to start fights and how difficult it is to actually start a fight? How much can you know about yourself if you've never been in a fight? How much can you know about yourself if you never had a nemesis? You have a person who's, who's your opposite, who you need to go against, someone who really wants to see you fall. It, it took people out of a comfort zone, which I think was important. And especially gamers who don't necessarily aren't getting in fights at bars, you know, but it was an outlet to find a place to prove yourself and you could do that with your controller. There's always gonna be some players out there that love to stir up controversy and claim that they're the best. And if they can't say that they're that good, they wanna be able to say, well, at least my, my side of the country's the best. In like 2004 through like 2006, there was definitely like this East Coast versus West Coast rivalry. It seemed like, you know, the West Coast always had the better players, but we felt like New York and the East Coast in general had just so many like good solid players. So we thought like crew battle would be the best thing to hype it up. The Kishes had come up with the idea of the crew battle somewhat recently to that, and they're like, okay, FC is perfect for this. Yo, we're going to FC3. Hills, yeah. Tired and hungry, bro. Tired and hungry. Tired and hungry. Like every other poor black man. It is a game crazed community that stretches around the world, and today, 200 members of this online gaming community are causing a melee in the gym of Trinity Evangelical Free Church in South Bend. It was just like a smash experience. It wasn't just a tournament because the church was the venue as well as where you're sleeping. It was just an insane amount of interaction between smashers at all times. Like, it, it was just loads of fun. No one knows that I'm like a real practical pranker. <laughs> While they sleeping, I put powder in their face. There's one time like Isaiah, he's like a heavy, heavy sleeper. I put like almost half the bottle on his head. 
most of what they did was in good fun. There were definitely times Wes would take it overboard. Some of the things he did with like the man sauce. I remember actually like hearing about the man because they would post it on Smash Boards in like big bold red letters and they're like, they just called him a really good Roy player and he's like unstoppable, I guess, because he has the fire. It's a really, really hot sauce. It's not like you could pour it. You have to scoop it out with a spoon. I was like mad at first. I'm like, dude, who the hell is the man? I bet he's not that good. I kick his ass. When people are sleeping, I'll put a little man sauce on their lip. I, I got a little bit of the man at FC. It was, it was not fun. <laughs> everyone who was everyone was at this tournament. And I even remember when we read off the bracket, one of the hosts said, you know, I can't think of a single person we're missing. There was four regions, East Coast, South, Midwest, and West Coast. Who are one this was the best region. Surprise, surprise, it was West Coast versus East Coast for the championship. Like, there's already trash talking going on, but when something like that happens, like, there's hype. The pressure was so serious before that, that we had one of our starters drop out due to nervousness. Mike G actually came up and said the same thing. He's like, dude, I don't think I can do this either, man. We're like, dude, are you serious? Like, is this really that hype? High tension, high pressure, a lot of talking crap to everybody. Um, I was in it, I choked. This thing is scared! This thing is scared! Oh! I still haven't lived that down, that's how funny it is. It's been, what, like eight years almost? Like, and I still haven't lived it down. Like, people still bring up that crew battle. Wes was also our captain and the most vocal. And so he's talking shit as he's playing hugs. I don't think he, he was able to take it. Not, not too many people was able to take trash talk from us at all. The West Coast players are more calm. When you get to the East Coast players, they're loud, they'll scream. This is how we do it on the East Coast. It's not easy. Not only do you have to play, but you have to deal with all the pressure of not being good enough or being heckled while you play. You just have to zone it all out. You just have to focus and zone it all out. He had one of the earliest uh, really well-developed runaway foxes. So it was a very good, you know, tactic at that time. <laughs> Crazy Jones was like our secret weapon to neutralize Canada. It worked out perfectly. And then it came down to DSF and as an... It was just incredible. Like when, especially just having Asim pull it out was kind of symbolic. Like, you know, it's not like a forever thing. Like, okay, now we're forever better. But at that point, at that point, there was there wasn't much West Coast could say. Like it went when when that came up as an issue on the boards. Like you know, they 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 pretty much held their tongue. I still have the dollar bill actually uh, signed by all of West Coast, by every member of the West Coast team, Ken and Isaiah and all of them. They signed the dollar bill and I keep it and I keep it near and dear um, in, my, in my bedroom. After the crew battles were complete, Ken took first place in singles. Even with the combined talent on the East Coast in a one-on-one -on -one matchup, Ken was still the best. But the notoriety of being number one was beginning to take a toll on the 19-year-old. I think when you're at the top and when you've been at the top for so long, it's hard to maintain the motivation, it's hard to perform and be, I guess, disciplined in your matchups when everyone's rooting against you. He was playing a game that he happened to be pretty good at and all of a sudden people were like angry that he was good at this game. He found it very inhospitable and he didn't really enjoy traveling at all. There was 501. There it is. I found it louder. Ah! Ken! 
he didn't want to do it anymore because he always came to the conclusion that if I go, people are going to yell at me, they're going to trash talk me, I won't feel very good about being there, I'll only have like three people to cheer me on, my sisters and even, you know, smash friends, and he'll just get really like demoralized by the atmosphere. After years of rivalries and intense competition, Ken needed a different perspective on Smash. A perspective he found uh, from Captain, Captain Jack. Jack. How does it feel to be the winner of a major American event? Captain Jack said that he was hosting a tournament in West Coast Japan. He wanted like the top players from America to come over. Isaiah and I were just the only two like top players that decided to go. I did it mostly because I just looked at the overall costs and I realized there's no way I can afford going to Japan normally. We were going to get housing for free for like over two weeks. We we're going to get to see Mount Fuji. For me, it was kind of more like I wanted to travel to Japan and enjoy the culture over there and also um, get better at Smash and learn their style. Unbelievable. It was awesome. It was not like America at all. Everything was like really compact. We went to a lot of the temples, palaces. And the food was amazing there. And Jack's mom was very accommodating. She took care of us, you know, fed us, things like that. Yakisoba. Yakisoba. We're in Japan. What do you say, Locke? Japanese Denny's? We're in Japan. We should eat Japanese food. Every day, like, a smash would like, come over, like, Captain Jack is like, oh, Masashi's coming over today. Masashi. Oh, 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 I think it's Masashi VI. When they play Smash, they play Smash. It's like they play all day, all night, all day, all night. <laughs> the weakest Japanese player was definitely like as strong as our strongest player in America. How do you feel about this competition, Ken? What do you mean? I don't really care. I'm here to enjoy Japan. I think there was like around 65 to 80 Japanese players there. And I just wanted to learn, you know, just to learn and take back uh, what what I saw at the Jack Iron tournament. We saw early on when they were making the bracket, Captain Jack told me he was going to have to play Bomb Soldier, and he said, um, "Yeah, he's a he's a pretty good player." Bomb Soldier just like came out of nowhere and just started beating all these top Japanese players. I've never seen Alcos move that fast the Falco Killer combos. I ended up fighting Bomb Soldier in the finals, and that was that was probably one of the toughest Falcos I've ever fought in my life. After Bach was able to bring back um, some of the videos from Japan, I think that inspired more Falco players to take Falco to the next level. Bomb Soldier won the first two games, and it quickly became clear that this was going to be a really intense set. Ken had to play pretty seriously. In Japan, the players are so respectful, it's beyond belief. And I know Ken has made that comment many times. Yeah, there was no shit talk. Everyone was like pretty calm or relaxed. It was just like how I would imagine like a, a tournament should be. The players like cheered for him equally as much as they did for their own players. Like when he won the tournament, I mean, they have videos of how ec ecstatic everyone was. And um, he was getting support from the Japanese players. Like if that had happened in a crew battle or something in the US, um, and a player from another country won, I don't think they would have gotten that same level of respect. They just want to play the game and have fun. We got to know each other relatively well, and he was a very nice guy. I sometimes didn't understand why people gave him a hard time. I think it was probably because some of the 
way he acted at times could come across the, the wrong way. In America, the scene was big enough, so it was all about, you know, um, trying to be the best person, trying to, like, burn bridges or trying to uh, create or even fabricate rivalries for the sake of it to make yourselves better. He banned people like DSF and Hugs from attending his, his tournaments because it's, it kind of indirectly set up a, a rivalry. He felt like I was out to get him. Like I wanted to be the best and I wanted to learn from him and then take him out and that's not what it is. It's like, yeah, I want to learn from you. You are the best. Great, you know. Beat me when I'm good. It was hard to be diplomatic about it. I think I was cut off from half LA scene because of um, my alliance with Ken. Already commanding, Ken's crew became even more powerful when one of the East Coast's top players began dating his sister and joined the Alliance. I uh, basically pledged my allegiance to the West Coast. You know, Chillinger and Asm were all mad at me. They were like, no, Chu, we don't want to play with you anymore. We don't want to be your friend anymore. They were just like really, really mad at me. You know, I, I felt kind of sad, but you know, I, you know, I went to the West Coast, so I got to stick with the West Coast. He was part of the Alliance. He was calling himself sort of like a adopted Californian at the time. Shortly after that, Azen actually took his first like uh, retirement. Like he, you know, took a break from the game for the first time. And since Chu had started, you know, swearing his allegiance to the West Coast, I, I pretty much like was just H2IL by myself. The scene was changing and changing in Ken's favor. He won the MLG championships for the second straight year and entered his third year of nearly undisputed domination. When EGM ran an article naming the five most dangerous gamers, Ken was among them. I feel like nowadays, like, there's dominant players, but no one was as dominant as Ken this time. Like, he just did not lose, simple as that. As 2006 dawned, the last thing anyone could imagine was a contender for the throne Ken had forged, least of all in a wannabe pro skater hailing from a sleepy New York suburb called Port Chester. Just to know that you are That's not a hard My philosophy is like, you know, if you put pressure on anybody, they're gonna crack eventually. He's better than me, I was like, so I gotta play this guy. Well, some of the stories I might say I might get PZ Chris in trouble, so. <laughs> they just can't handle me right now. You see guys like flock and I'm like, relax. You know, let her breathe, you know? PC was just pulling out all kinds of new tricks. Ken wasn't someone who just stumbled upon the skill. Ken was someone who wanted to win. In 2005... Um, I can't believe this is still 2005. <laughs>